Today we're going to okay. hear Keith uh, Martin talk about the small town movie theaters in our area. Keith? Thank you. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this presentation of the Gale and Park Theaters. And as he mentioned, I am Keith Martin. Uh, I'm the curator of the much smaller museum in Galesburg, though we do hope to expand this summer and build on. I think we could probably fit uh, four or five of our museums just on this floor. <laughs> I am happy to be here at the Battle Creek Regional uh, Historical Museum. It's uh, always fun to come over here. Uh, we always get a nice crowd. That's really nice. Uh, in my former life, I was a teacher and a bus driver at Gillsburg Augusta, and I see that one of my fellow bus drivers showed up here. I'm always appreciative of that. Uh, this topic kind of fits right in with my obsession. Since retirement from teaching, I retired twice, once from teaching after 35 years and once after uh, driving bus for 46 years. But after I didn't have to correct papers every night at home, I started attending movies. And as an example, in 2018, I went to the movie theater 91 times to see movies. Now that was only 62 different movies, but I've been known to go to a movie that I like 10 times. So anyway, uh, this year has not been a very good year for movies so far. I've only been to 10 movies, so I've got a long ways to go. So when time permits, I like to attend as many movies as I can, especially in small towns. Uh, one of my favorites is a remodel theater in Howell, Michigan. That's uh, west of uh, Brighton, north of Pinckney. Another of my favorites is a, a nice little theater just been redone in Encinitas, California. And that's a fun theater to go to. So if you have time, that's the problem. You know, it takes a lot of time to get to these places. But when I do, I love to find the small town theaters. They're really a lot of fun. I was hoping maybe Dave Frank would be here today. Dave's the third generation of the Frank family that operated the theaters. He called me, uh, I think it was two nights ago, and said he was flying in from Florida. So I told him not to worry if he didn't get to see this, that we would uh, arrange to do this in Augusta, maybe at his theater, if he wants to open it up again. And he usually likes to do that, or we'll do it at the McKay Library. All right, let's start with the Gale Theater. One of my classmates, Hugh Forster, was in a bowling league at the Gale. The ceiling was low. He picked up his bowling bag, believing that the ball was in it. So with the strength that he used to pick the ball up, he propelled the bag up into the ceiling, damaging it. <laughs> That's just one of the things that you get as a, a remembering uh, when you ask people, what do you remember about the Gale Theater? And uh, it's always fun to hear the stories, and there are a million of them. Much of the information that I have, that's Hugh Forster right there, uh, came from uh, Harriet and John Roloff. Those are Carl Roloff's two children, and they were the ones that ran the theater last, uh, Helen and, and Carl. Um, also, Dave Frank has been very, very helpful. Dave's 86, and his health is, uh, you know, for anyone 86, it's not what it used to be. And he has been kind of digging around the basement, and he's really turned over a lot of information that's helped me to do this. He's a wonderful person, and I think he really wants his theater remembered, as I do. That's Harriet and John. Uh, Harriet does not live in Galesburg. John still does. The very first motion picture theater in Galesburg actually was the Rex Theater. Now today that, that theater would be located at the east end of the present day hardware store. And I can remember uh, Rick Bresson, he passed away not too long ago took me down into the basement so that I could see the indentations where the slanted floor originally had been uh, placed. And uh, before the motion picture days, it was a vaudeville theater. And my father, Francis Martin, which you can see in the middle, lower, remembers performing at the theater with his harmonica. 
Now that uh, block, in a sense, the blocks in those days were actually buildings. They weren't a whole uh, segment from street to street. That's, but the Cory block burned down in 1919, that whole section over here. And at that time, or right after that 1919 fire, uh, Harvey Hill was the theater manager. He later uh, managed the Ideal Tourist Camp, which was on East Michigan Avenue in Galesburg. Also, prior to the Gale Theater, there were movies shown at the Masonic Temple on Friday nights. And those titles were usually advertised either in the Argus or other papers. Of course, the Argus also ran ads for uh, showings at the State Theater. <clears throat> okay, the Gale Theater was built by Eli Franks. Actually, it's Frank, not Franks. Uh, Eli's family turned out to be three generations of movie entertainers. His brothers ran theaters in Whalen and also in Cedar Springs. Eli also served a term as mayor of Galesburg for a time, and that was in the 40s. And he also served on the county board of supervisors between 45 and 46. Lena Frank was Dave's or was Dave's grandmother, and she opened the Franks Opera House in Wayland in 1911. And the Franks first movie theater shown, they used a black and white silent uh, picture camera. It was hand cranked. It was an 1893 Edison kinetoscope. It was one of the first in the area. <clears throat> Okay, the theater was named the Gale. They built it. It opened in June of 1941. It's Art Deco, which some people call modern. It was constructed in a relatively short time at a cost of about $35,000, and that included the projection equipment. The original section was 35 feet wide and 118 feet deep. Uh, local men built it. Jim Solomon of Galesburg was the contractor, and the building was built with cement blocks, and they were covered with stucco, which was a very common way of building in those days. The auditorium was built with a special sound-absorbing uh, block, which could entirely eliminate echo or hollow reverberations that were caused by wall surface reflection. The theater featured heavy carpets, slanted floor, special lighting features, air conditioning, and a cry room. The cry room was located upstairs and was designed so that mothers could care for their children to see the movie without disturbing other theater patrons. That theater could hold 400 people. According to an article from the newspaper, probably the Kalamazoo Gazette, the theater was built at 110 East Michigan and that was on property that was purchased for Mr. and Mrs. Robert Blake. And of course, the Blake family is an old family in Galesburg uh, noted for raising sheep. At the time of purchase, a house sat on that lot, and it was purchased by Eugene Brown. Now, Eugene Brown was the local house mover, and he moved more than just houses in Galesburg. Um, I really would love to have a whole lecture just on the, the places that Eugene Brown moved. Anyway, he moved part of the house to his property, which was east of the theater, behind the consumer substation next to the library, and he moved the other part to a place on, or to a lot on New Street. The first movie was entitled Pot of Gold, starred Jimmy Stewart, Paulette Goddard. The movies were shown nightly with a matinee shown on, on Sundays. And at least in the 50s, the theater advertised its upcoming movie in paper handouts, which one could pick up as they left the theater. And you could be put on a mailing list. Also, of course, the ads were run in the Gazette, in the Argus, I'm sorry. Um, it's amazing the stuff I've collected since I was four years old. And for some reason, I, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I saved that. And that was one of those little paper brochures that they would pass out when you left. I don't remember the price being 20 cents, but that's the bunch of tickets that John gave me. Um, when I went, it was 17 cents. So, so that was eight pot bottles you had to find along the road to pay for <laughs> admission. 
It's interesting, um, if any of you knew Kay Maxson, Kay Maxson owned the Maxson Agency in Galesburg at number one, East Battle Creek Street. They were remodeling, and of course that was the old Michigan, it was an old Galesburg State Bank. And on top of the safe, they found that Gale Theater advertisement. And as you know, in the Argus, they always had the park stuff and the Gale stuff advertised. The theater debut was a fine affair. Interesting to learn how important these small town theaters were to the movie industry. Remember in those days there were no multiplexes and many small towns had theaters such as Galesburg and Augusta. Of course, some small towns didn't. As it is today, almost no small towns have theaters and people have to drive, I call, meet, meet moderate or long distances to a large town to see a movie. An envelope handed to me by Dave Frank contained these telegrams. And these telegrams show the importance of small town theaters. Because back in those days when a new theater opened, telegrams were sent out by the studios with messages of congratulations. And they were always signed by movie stars of the day. These I have, or some of these I have actually framed, and they're in Galesburg in our museum. They're, they're a marvelous. As you can see, Barbara Stanwyck, Henry Fonda, Dorothy Lemur, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby. And of course, whether they actually sent them out or whether it was the publicity part, uh, department, it's still pretty impressive. And it still shows how important small town theaters were to communities and to the movie industry. In 1946, the theater building was expanded to the west with a recreational addition. This new facility included restrooms, a pool table, booths for sitting and ordering food, and two horseshoe counters seating up to 38 customers for ordering food, snacks, and beverage. Of course, non-alcoholic. The soda fountain that you see here was designed by the Bastion Blessings Company. It was believed there was none finer available at the time anywhere. So while the Franks owned the theater, parking was a bit of a problem since the theater was surrounding and the surrounding parking lot were built on fill. That whole area, of course, was lowland from the Kalamazoo River. And one has to remember that the mill race ran right through the area where the, the theater is today. <clears throat> So people, they dumped stuff behind the theater for years. And during World War II, the Argus ran ads advertising free tickets for Phil brought in to help extend the parking area. And today you would just, you would never guess that, that that's what happened in those days. <clears throat> Once in a while I'll probably forget a, a photo here and I'll have to run back and catch you up. But anyway, uh, upstairs was a four-lane bowling alley with Brunswick equipment. Now just because the word Brunswick on it doesn't mean that was automatic. These were Brunswick, but they were hand set pins. But this recreation area was a real boon for Galesburg, especially local teenagers. As we know today, local teenagers really don't have anything like this you know, now. It's too bad. It was reported in May when it opened that there was nothing like it in the area. Mr. and Mrs. L. Ehrman were the managers, and at one time, full-time and part-time employees numbered 25. So it really did uh, take care of a lot of people. Many young men in Galesburg worked as pin setters before the advent of the Brunswick automatic pin setter. And according to John Roloff, it seemed like just about every kid in Galesburg set pins at one time or another. It was even a family fair. I know one family, the Hendershots, had Al, Kenny, and Kathy, and they all had set pins at one time or another. Wayne Allen was manager of that bowling alley for a while, and his brother Gary, who still lives in Galesburg, uh, set pins for him. And even Dave Frank himself spent his time working in, quote, in the pits of the large <laughs> of the lanes at the Gale. And it was a rather dangerous adventure each night. 
for the pin setters. One had to protect one's body the best they could because those pins could really fly when the professional bowlers were doing their thing. It was the pins that bounced off the walls that could get you in the head. This is one of those photos that Dave gave me and this was an original picture from when it first opened. So that's what the bowling alley looked like. Of course this is what it looks like today. You can see the dust in the middle lane there. But you could actually still go upstairs and you could still bowl. And I believe you could get a strike nearly every time because their grooves in the floor are so worn in <laughs> that you could set the ball down and kick it. <laughs> Anyway, I know a lot of the, the fellows that worked at the auto parts underneath there used to come up occasionally and, and bowl, a, bowl a couple of sets. I've been told that all the pin setters were afraid of Harry Lang. Harry Lang was the man who owned the hardware store. And um, they say that he'd have the ball almost touching the ceiling before his swing began. And apparently his delivery was fast and furious and the pins would really fly. And occasionally one of the offended pin setters would toss a spinning pin back up the alley to remind <laughs> Harry to knock it off. Ed Stager, a good friend of mine, though he doesn't live in Galesburg anymore, recalls that though dangerous, one could make some pretty good money on nights that the leagues played. They started at 7 o'clock, and by the third league, you could earn 12 to $15 plus tips. And for the 1950s, that was pretty good money. John Roloff remembers that the women's league was possibly a little more of a social gathering than the leagues for the men. And sometimes the social discussions were so intense that a bowling ball was tossed before the poor pin setter could even get the pin set up. It was January 1st. 1948 that Carl and Helen Roloff took over the Gale after purchasing it. But to regress for just a little bit, Carl was a silent partner with Grant Johnston in Grant's department store. Oh, there's one more. There we go. Grant's department store, of course, was really county well known. It was, it was the place. If you couldn't find something in your small town, you came to Grant's because it was hanging on the ceiling. It was somewhere. It was quite a place. Anyway, Carl was a silent partner in Grant's department store. And then across the street, he had his own store, which was a grocery store right here. So that was um, Roloff's Market. Um, Carl did remodel that store in 1942 before he went off to serve um, in the service. Uh, he served four years in the Army during World War II. He returned in 47. And the last duty was being on Okinawa, and he was there to secure that island with the troops he was with. I thought maybe Craig Bishop might be here today, but he's not. No, he's, he's on his way to Florida. Okay, he's, uh, Craig is uh, a part of this museum, and that's Craig right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's with uh, Uncle Carl. While gone, the store, of course, was in capable hands of some other people, these people right here. Whoop, those are the military friends. Sylvia Kelly, Al Mowat, and Les Carpenter were several of the people that took care of the store while he was in the service. Um, upon his return, he sold his interest in grants, sold the grocery store to Jim Buckley, married his climax gal, Helen Pete, Honeymooned in northern Michigan, where he won a brand new Ford convertible in a Catholic raffle at the U UP State Fair. That's a good welcome back from the service. Then he returned to Galesburg to start his new venture, owning and running the Gale Theater and Recreation. Also before that takeover, though, he did take a trip to California in that brand new car because he wanted to visit all the people that he had served with that were in California. And apparently there was a, a lot of fun. This is Carl right here. After Carl took over the theater and the snack bar, 
the Franks then built a new theater in Augusta called the Park, which opened in November of 49. And to show you how dense people can be, it never dawned on me why they called it the Park until I realized they built it by the Park. <laughs> oh, well. At the time of purchase, Frenchie and Al Ehrman managed the bowling alley and the snack bar. Let me get you another picture. That's that Ford convertible they won, by the way. And that's on their farm, Grandpa, Grandpa's farm. OK. And that's the USO building. And that's where the park was built. So anyway, uh, at the time of the purchase, the Ermans ran the bowling alley and the snack bar, and Bob McBarnes operated the movie projector, and his wife Agnes sold tickets uh, at, the wick, at the ticket window. Even Grandpa John, he's the one who started Roll Off Dairy in the 20s, 1928, I think it was, he even took tickets for a while. And so did Helen's father collect tickets for a while. There were a lot of memories made at the Gale Theater, as probably at any small theater. Everyone can remember Carl walking the aisles with his flashlight in hand or in his back pocket. In the mid-50s, I can remember paying 17 cents for my ticket and hoping that I'd have enough money to purchase candy from the vending machine just inside the door to the right. Back in the 50s, the Gale was uh, famous for hosting the annual Saturday Christmas party sponsored by the Galesburg Lions Club. Besides a movie, there was a lot of candy and it was handed out to the kids and drawings for presents, including bicycles. It really was a big deal in those days because there were a lot of children that struggled uh, in their families and with their families and they just had that hope for some kind of a special gift. These are the keys, by the way, that Dave, uh, I guess you can say gave them to me. I have them framed and I have them framed with those telegrams in the, our museum, but those are the keys that operated those Mark, uh, casings for the advertising. In a recent conversation with Russ Hawkins, this is Russ Hawkins, Russ Hawkins Jr. who runs uh, Dreamers, it was pretty obvious that that party was a strong memory in his mind. He said he just couldn't believe how packed the place was with kids and he couldn't figure out where they all came from. It really was a big deal. It was reported that in December of 53, a 3D and widescreen uh, screen was installed at the theater. And then in 1954, there was a fire. It caused extensive damage to the recreation end, not so much at the theater end. The repairs were made and business carried on. And it was believed that the fire was started in an air duct that was built of fiberboard. Remember, this was built during World War II, and probably um, it was cheaper or maybe more available to buy this fiberboard than it was to buy uh, tin or steel or whatever. And so, anyway, they, cons they figured that probably one of the pin setters was smoking, even though it was prohibited, and thought they were going to get caught, and they threw that cigarette down one of those uh, ducks, and it caught this building on fire. Luckily, nobody was injured. Harriet recalls the night of the fire because her father locked her in the ticket office. And when he came back for her, they walked across the street and Carl just stood there and watched the event, assuredly de uh, devastated. Harriet remembers wanting to go with her dad to the theater at night and being told, not tonight. So she would hide in the back of the car and pop out when he got to the theater. Carl always laughed at that. Her other memory was sitting next to people she knew at the theater hoping that they would share their candy with her. And they usually did. Now John, if you know John, great guy, but he, uh, he really put his parents through it. I always say he just gave his dad a run for his money. One of those incidences was the night that John rode his bike down and up the aisles of the theater during a showing of the movie with his father in flashlight in hot pursuit. <laughs> John also recalls the popular singer, Dale Shannon, used to hang out at the snack bar in the back room, playing his guitar, 
while the others play pool. If you know Del Shannon, remember, and most of us are old enough probably to do that, one of his most famous songs was Runaway. There is a Del Shannon Museum. It's located in Coopersville, Michigan. It's a place where I own stock in the Coopersville and Marne Railway, so I get up there occasionally. That's west of Grand Rapids. So the snack bar was a very popular place in Galesburg, you know, for young kids to hang out. Helen remembers, contrary to what some people wanted to believe, that the youth were well supervised. Drinking and smoking were not permitted. The two pinball machines and the pool tables, and they were very popular, as well as the jukebox, playing the tunes of the time. The favorite beverage was, anyone have any idea? No, Sun Drop. And the food menu included hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, and onion rings. Also popular were the homemade pies that Helen baked and served. The Roloffs often mentioned that they were glad not to have to deal with the drugs that came to teenagers later. When the snack bar was first opened by the Frank family, there were only two major ice cream producers in the area. Any idea? Swift, Swift and Arctic. So they had a tasting committee. And it was the opinion of the tasting committee that Swift was the better of the two. So that was the ice cream that was featured at the snack bar. That's all Art Deco, by the way. It's a, it was an Art Deco era. One memory of Barb Johnson Eldridge, now Barb Johnson would be Grant Johnson's daughter, was the sound of the pins over, overhead constantly being knocked down. And I'm sure that's probably the same memory a lot of people have when they were downstairs in, in this room. As mentioned earlier, bowling was very popular. Under roll-off management, both men and women leagues were formed and the leagues bowled during the week. And then on the weekends, they of course were open for open bowling. Danny Daniels and Wayne Allen again, uh, at least at some time, helped in this area. Helen remembered that Bob Van Sickler helped form the leagues in the fall. And apparently there were some very good bowlers in both the men's and the women's leagues. And so at the end of the season, the award banquet was held of course at Inman's. And that's where the, the bowlers were rewarded and awarded. There were several projectionists at the theater over the years, uh, including Bob McBarnes, Cal Denicus, Ed Greer, Jim Bolton, and Ed Glady. And I knew most of those people. Mike Carpenter uh, recalls that when the Greyhound bus stopped in the Berg, that's Galesburg, and quite often uh, that Greyhound bus was driven by Cecil Burge, who lived in Galesburg, that the film containers were dropped off, unloaded, and they were taken in the Sinclair station so that the people from the Gale could come and pick those up. In the snack bar area, workers included Kathy Haste, Miriam Maxim, Jeanette Allen, Betty Lenting, Violet Watts, Ellen Osterling, and Duane O'Donnell. Of course, these were the regulars, but there were others that worked there for shorter periods of time. Harriet herself worked in the theater on Friday and Saturday nights from the time she was in the sixth grade right into high school. She had begged her dad to let her clean the theater and make the popcorn. Helen also remembers what a wonderful job Isla Fry did at that ticket window. She had a great personality and she was very pleasant to customers. The final memory of Harriet was that her dad was a good friend of Bill Knapp. When starting his first restaurant in Battle Creek, they often went there to eat. And Harriet believes that she was probably one of the very first members of the Bill Knapp's birthday club. And she also remembers that Bill Knapp himself would stop by to chat with her dad. Carl and family ran the business up until his death in 1966. He suffered a fatal heart attack while vacationing in northern Michigan. So his wife, Helen, with the encouragement from Betty Lenting, and Violet Watts continued to run the business, snack bar in the bowling alley. And shortly after, Farmcrest moved into the theater section after losing their building in the famous 67 snowstorm. I think we all remember that snowstorm. 
that's the Farmcrest building. It's directly across the street from Harding's parking lot in Galesburg, and that whole roof caved in. So Farmcrest needed to find a new place. Uh, that's where they kept all their trucks and stuff. So uh, they redid the back of the theater since it was closed, and that's where Farmcrest moved to. Though I don't think it was for very many years, and I don't think Farmcrest exists anymore. And it said that a soft drink company followed Farmcrest, but I do not remember that. Now the recreation part, they kept open until May 27th of 1972, so it lasted about six years longer than the theater did. Helen then sold the building to Ellen Marion Dunlap. Uh, they had a lawn equipment business, sold international uh, equipment there, and the Dunlaps eventually sold the building to Roloff Dairy, and that was in 1983. Um, and they did own it until just recently. Uh, the ice cream plant was built much later, and I think it was in 89, and that was built behind uh, the theater and a little bit to the southeast. Today the east end is the Pizza King and the west end is vacant, and uh, lastly being used by a, a parts, depart or parts store. This is what it looks like, of course, today. They, uh, when they remodeled it, they've kind of hidden a lot of the art deco-ness though it's still kind of round in here, but they covered up the glass block windows and uh, kind of a neat building. Uh, I've been through it several times recently and uh, there's even a room under here that must have been an old coal bin. And uh, they're gonna have to fill that in because the beams are getting really rusty under there. But anyway, we'll get into that too. That building now has been purchased by a rich one man who plans on turning the theater into a distillery. And I was telling some people the, uh, the equipment's already in the back. It's apparently was shipped here from Germany. And they're planning on using uh, the part that was a snack bar to serve food and drink. I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna work. They've kind of talked that maybe Pizza King could provide uh, pizza for a while anyway. And uh, I'm not sure when that's gonna get finished. I've talked to that man several times. I've, offered to do some brush hogging for him to clean up the back and we're going to try and put a trail back because that's where it's going to meet the um, bicycle path. And they think that's kind of a neat idea that people could bicycle on in. Uh, oh yes, and the upstairs where the bowling alley is, which is right here, is going to be restored. So that's really fun news to hear that. Here's a few, yeah. A uh, few interesting things that can be said about uh, Helen Pete, who became Helen Roloff. She was kind of an accomplished artist. These are some of the paintings that she did. She was, of course, from Climax, so a lot of these are Climax. And... She's related to Dick Martin. Now that's not my cousin, Dick Martin. This is the Dick Martin of the famous Laugh-In. That show ran from 68 to 73. Uh, he was um, originally from Battle Creek. And he has very fond memories of both Galesburg and Augusta. You can look at those while I turn the page to the next part. Ooh, those are some of the people that gave me information for, for this segment. All right, let's move on to the park. Okay, after the Frank family sold the theater to the Roloff family, that was in 1948, they went to Augusta and decided to build another theater. Now that's about four or five miles away. And again, the spot chosen was the old US, um, USO building located at 108 East Clinton Street. And that's south of the Village Park. Now this picture was actually given to me by the Roloffs this is actually on uh, Webster Street, South Webster, and uh, that sign appeared long before they actually uh, did the building. 
My understanding is that this building was the USO. I know my mom used to go there during World War II. And um, that building was moved up to Western. It became the ROTC program building. But I think they saved the chimney and the fireplace, and that was used when they built the park. So I thought it was kind of interesting uh, to actually move a building like that up to Western, but that's apparently what happened. The park was the last single screen theater built in Kalamazoo County, and it's the last to survive as a theater. The building's design would be considered Art Deco, or modern, as some people would say. It was built to seat 432 people with a cry room upstairs, just like the first one did. It even came with baby lounge and it had cribs up there for the kids. There was also another room up there that was available as a party room, which would accommodate up to 12 people. There was no charge for that, but you had to make reservations. The structure had a Quonset style, if you know what a Quonset is. I really don't have the picture of the Quonset, I just have the brochure that came when they built the building. But a Quonset is a round roofed, you can't tell the roof from the sides because it looks like half of a tin can. And it's made of corrugated steel. And uh, the ticket booth and the lobby, they were added to the front and not part of the Quonset part of it. This building was 70000 which is about double what they uh, paid to build the uh, Gale Theater. And its measurements were 64 feet wide and 125 feet uh, in depth. The interior was modern design with decorations in pastel corals and turquoise, typical colors of the Art Deco. The interior used colored wall lighting the front of the building was constructed of permastone, glass brick, and Carrera glass. The screen was a new type called Stark Cycloramic. It was given, to, uh, it was supposed to give greater dimension and depth to the viewing experience and was supposed to be easier on the eyes. You can see here there's the fireplace. It was two-sided, so it uh, was kind of neat. This is the, the lobby of it popcorn machine. That's why I go to movies. Popcorn and Pepsi. Carving was a deep rose pattern in the foyers and terrazzo was used in the outer lobby. It took 90 yards of coral tapestry to create the traveling curtain that covered the uh, screen on stage. One of the few changes made to the park was that after 40 years the carpeting had to be replaced. And in 50, 1953, they did do some stage work. The seats were worth mentioning because they were crawler, pushback seats. And you, you had to sit in one to realize how it worked, but it had two positions in it, and one was a little more comfortable than the other. You could sit up straight or you could kind of relax a little bit. And of course, only Dave Frank would have kept the original patches. <laughs> They chose the, the, uh, the fabric. As advertised, it was an environment in which one would breathe germ-free air. So in addition to the fireplace, the main floor housed circular restrooms with marble floors, and the entire theater was finished with birch woodwork. And over the years, Dave has kept the building's blueprints and samples of the cloth used in the making of the theater seats, as I already told you. The theater opened on November 23rd and 24th of 1949, showing the movie The Red Pony. This was a Wednesday night, and on Thursday night, uh, sorry, they showed that movie on Wednesday and Thursday, and then on the next two nights, Friday and Saturday, they showed the movie Yellow Sky, and that starred John Wayne, Gail Russell, and Gig Young. When the park opened, the theater received congratulatory telegrams, just like they did at the Gale from the likes of Red Skeleton, June Ellison, Van Johnson, Ava Gardner, Esther Williams, and Clark Gable. If you ask anyone under the age of 25, they would not even know who any of those people are. <laughs> but I say, how could you not prosper and succeed with telegrams from people such as these? Dave purchased the theater from his father in 1957 from Eli. 
after, of course, having spent most of his life around the building anyway, Dave likes to reminisce that he learned at an early age how to thread the projector by starting at the bottom end. That's more of the telegrams. Because he wasn't tall enough to reach the top. Barbara came to work at the theater on January 1st of 1960. And 21 years later, he married her. So now it's Dave and Barb. Part of the success of the park was the way the business was run. Dave and his wife did everything, having few outside employees. This, no doubt, came from the family history of the family doing the whole operation. It started when Dave's grandmother used all six of her children in the business just to survive. And, of course, these were lessons learned during the Depression. This young lady is Tina Wade Gray. She was one of my first fifth graders when I was teaching. And she uh, was one of the few outsiders that they did hire. She worked at the concession stand for uh, quite a few years. Um, she worked from her junior year in high school until long after she graduated from college. And she loved working there. She alternated weekends f uh, with another uh, young lady called Sharon Bay. And she got to know a lot of folks in that job. And she really loved working for Barb and Dave. That again is the lobby. Um, I don't know exactly where it is, but somewhere in here, and I'll mention this later, is a button that he uses to uh, start the projector so he didn't have to go upstairs so he could do it all. He could take tickets and, and then when it's time he'd start the projector. It's also a good place to mention that um, during the Depression, Eli grew the popcorn. He dried the prop popcorn and he shelled the popcorn. And then they popped and sold it. And many people said it's the best popcorn ever. And when the park opened, popcorn was sold for five cents a bag. Much of the park's success was keeping ticket prices as low as possible. And I think that's the one thing most people remember about the park. It was the one place you could still afford to go when ticket prices everywhere else were $3, $4, and $5. Many people in the area then could attend movies because we had the park theater for them to come to. In the last two decades that the theater was in business, the adult admission price was $1.50. That's where I remember that. And that was for first class movies. At that time, children accompanied by a parent paid 50 cents and the unaccompanied children paid a dollar. When Dave took over in 57, adults paid 35 cents for admission and children 15 cents. Then soon after that, prices went up to 50 and 25. Attention to details and to customers was, of course, of the utmost importance. With cleanliness and comfort, a friendly lady taking the tickets, that's Dave's wife, and a fire going in the fireplace, and Dave wearing his black coat and his bow tie, greeting each customer as they presented their tickets, people returned each weekend to experience a nostalgic, Small town theater. <clears throat> to help accomplish this attention to detail and being in total control, he automated the projectors by installing a remote control panel in the lobby. And with this modernization, again, he could conduct his greeting ticket taking job and run the rest of the theater with the push of a button. And of course, as time progressed, it became more difficult for Dave to acquire first class movies. The distributors, of course, preferred to place their new and popular movies at larger complexes with higher admissions and bigger gross ability. And of course, you can, that's pretty obvious that's what's going to happen. In the early 60s, the first multiplexes began to appear and they eventually caught on. The park was one of the last single screen theaters to close in the area. The last few that lingered on had to close when projection equipment changed to digital projection. This theater up here is the East Town. That's where I love to go. And of course, that was uh, where they put Menard, so that one disappeared. Now, the Strand in, in uh, Papa is one of the few that spent the money, bought the digitalized equipment, and they're now running uh, movies there. And that's in Papa. This is the Alamo downtown in, on Portage Street. It's changed hands several times. 
So that cost of that proje uh, projection equipment was, was really high. So that's why most of these places just went out of business. The park ran for 47 years before Dave and his wife decided to retire. The theater closed on December 1st of 1996. And on the closing night, Dave even had the two ornate wicker containers on stage that had been full of flowers on the opening night 47 years earlier. There's a lot of publicity involved with the closing. Articles appeared in many publications and people traveled long distances to stand in line for one last chance to relive part of their cherished past. Nostalgia is a pretty strong thing in our lives. So in July of 99, the Michigan Historical Commission placed the Park Theater on the State Register of Historic uh, Sites. In that same year, the park opened the theater up for a special showing of Oklahoma. Each year, starting in 1999, the park's, uh, park tried to open its doors for special showings. In the first five years, the theater presented South Pacific, Danny Kaye's A Song is Born, the Jack Lemmon Shirley MacLaine musical comedy Irma La Deuce, and the slapstick uh, extravaganza It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World. In its first 25 years, the longest playing movie was, any idea? It wasn't Gone with the Wind, it was Airport. Ran for 17 days. But in those first 25 years, Gone with the Wind played eight times with heavy patronage every time they showed it. All right, here's some fun facts with Gone with the Wind. Making of Gone with the Wind had these amazing facts. Clark Gable was the only male ever considered to play Rhett Butler while the female role of Scarlett O'Hara took an exhaustive two years to conduct over 1,400 interviews with actresses. And as we know, Vivian Lee finally was chosen. If you remember the scene, The Burning of Atlanta, that set was 40 acres of constructed buildings. They had to hire 1,200 extras for that one scene. And it could only be shot once. Because once you touch it off, it's gone. It should be mentioned that the park originally was open seven days a week. It was about 1954 when television became so popular that the theater reduced its schedule to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it would continue that way until its closing. Does anybody remember what one single program was one, one of the programs that was so so popular that some theaters actually shut the camera off and let this program show and then they would start it up again. I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy was so popular that a lot of people would not go to the theater that night. So over the years the park changed very little really except for the lobby changes and a little bit of stage work and the new brick exterior. One of Dave's prized possessions is that 1893 Edison kinetoscope uh, manufactured uh, and used by them. Um, his grandmother used that in 1911 in her opera house and Dave rebuilt that camera and he often had it on display in the lobby of the theater. And again, it was hand cranked and one of the very first projectors. I think that's Dave with that camera right there. And this is the one he learned how to out of thread by starting at the bottom. <laughs> Over the years, the Franks have had many wonderful people who have patronized the business since the theater was built. Even family generations have attended. And Dave and Barb still consider many of these people practically family. There are two uh, people that I know quite well, Lynn and Gary Blair. They attended the theater for at least 20 years before they closed. And they used to help out after a show by picking up the popcorn sacks and the empty drink containers. Then after they closed uh, its regular season, uh, the Blairs would volunteer to help the Franks open that theater for that yearly special uh, presentation. And that's really the kind of dedication that uh, people have had uh, for the Franks and the Park Theater. Rose Makowski, she ran Ted's Restaurant with her husband. That was around the corner. 
they did that for 47 years. And they attended the uh, park on a regular basis. Rose's daughter, Roseanne, who still lives in Augusta, was also raised on park theater movies. And she recalls that she attended nearly every movie when the movies changed. The Mikowskis remember finally how Eli and Dave didn't tolerate any nonsense from unruly children. <clears throat> Dave and his flashlight were legendary among the moviegoers. Sending those types of kids out of the theater made the movie much more pleasant for everyone else. Roseanne also remembers fondly the annual Christmas party, just as the Galesburg people did. Uh, the movie was free. Everyone received a bag of candy, and there was always a lot of gifts given away, again, including bicycles. Finally, she recalls an Augustonian businessman who ran the hardware and harness shop in Augusta. He was a regular attender of movies at the park. He sat in the second row on the east side of the theater, and whether Dave knew it or not, he must have known it, the old man brought along his own spittoon <laughs> and used it. And none of the regular kids wanted to be anywhere near him or the smell. <laughs> the park has been recognized not only as an historic site, but by the state uh, with an honorary tribute. That's uh, Lynn and Gary Blair always dressing up in costumes. <clears throat> this is the people that helped, whoops, didn't mean to do that. These are the people that helped put on some of those special events. <clears throat> hey, that's me. And then in 1997, oh, there's the Mikowskis at Ted's. That's a great picture. That was, that was the best place to get a burger. <clears throat> in 1997, Dave and Barb received a special award from the Gillsburg Gusset Community Forum for the caring for our community. That year, they happened to have a lot of really cool people getting the award. Oh, that's me. <laughs> this is Wes Burrow, and this is Ruth Burrow. Ruth was uh, our librarian in Galesburg in the early 50s, and Wes was probably the one of the best history teachers I ever had, and I'm a history major, and I had Willis Dunbar as one of my teachers. West Burrow was wonderful. Anyway, uh, that's the 97 group that <laughs> were inducted. Today, the Park Theater remains in a place, uh, luckily, it could really be open to almost any minute. It's truly a small town historic museum. Um, those cameras are still there, they can still be put on display really wouldn't take a whole lot of work, a little bit of money to get that digital projection equipment. Who knows, maybe that will happen. Maybe that's gonna happen in the future. Um, Dave's kept it in good shape, it's clean, it's, uh, well, maybe ready to roll for another generation. We can only hope. <clears throat> These are little extras here. I always try to acknowledge, uh, I get a lot of this information from you know, different people and of course Dave in this case. And I do a lot of research in the libraries, I go through notebooks and I usually sit there with a legal pad and I write down all these little bits of information that come in and I don't call myself an historian, I call myself a history gatherer. You just gather up all the stuff that's already there and you try to put it in some kind of format or presentation that makes sense. So. I kind of hope that's what I've done. Oh, yes. They met Phyllis Diller. Well, that certainly looks like Phyllis Diller, doesn't it? It was always a place for cool cars to meet. Oh, that's me. I, I usually use that at the beginning, but I wasn't sure how much time I had today. So anyway. Thank you so much for attending. That's our Gail. <laughs> Surely some of you may have comments. You probably attended the Gail or have something you'd like to share, and this is your chance. <laughs>
1966. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever go to the Redford? I did not. Where was that? That's in Redford, uh, down here in Detroit area. No. So it's an Art Deco, all restored, and they show old movies. You can get look at it online. Okay. We went to see um, Miracle on 34th Street with my granddaughters this year, and uh, it's all run by volunteers. Okay. I do get around the state wherever I can because I just love to go to these different theaters. Um, so I'll put that on my list. There's a nice old theater in Sutton's Bay as well. Sutton's Bay? Oh, yeah. yeah. One in Ann Arbor is nice. I was always sorry I never got to very many in Kalamazoo. Um, I, I mean, everyone went to the state capital, but you know there was the uh, Michigan, the Uptown, East Town, and Uptown. But I never got a chance to go to those. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you.